Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. Um, today actually something quite fun. So, uh, so-called skein relations. So the word skein doesn't mean anything. It's just a made up word. But anyway, they're called skein relations and they originate in the 1920s. Although it took a while for them to really take flight. Um, but they actually appear in real life. And although I will kind of explain everything in historically wrong order. Um, somehow life knows already and life uh, already determines the skein relation. And that's kind of fun. So the skein relation is a certain type of relation relating certain types of objects, as we will see. And yeah, so there are many choices involved. And essentially, no matter what you do, you will always end up with the same uh, results. And that's what I'm going to explain. And one of the results is what life does, actually. So skein relations, in case you can't guess, because the word here, skein, as I said, is completely made up, um, are part of knot theory. So uh, knots, one of my favorite objects ever, are just circles in uh, three space. And they're kind of knotted. And yeah, so this is an object here. And they appear everywhere in life. And this is what this video is all about somehow. Um, so here, so this is clearly a mathematical knot somehow. So you see the knot and you see the shadows that I'm going to draw um, on the, uh, well, on the sheets here, on the three projections. And as you can see, the shadows are quite different. So the main goal of knot theory is to find invariance such that the shadow will determine, or you can associate a number to the shadow such, such that you will have some ch chance to go back from the real object, which is a three-dimensional object, uh, sorry, the other way around, from the shadow back to the real object, which is a three-dimensional object. And this is really applicable. One of my favorite pictures here on the right-hand side is a knotted protein. So um, the kind of the, the bigger your molecules, your compounds get, the more important it actually is how they arrange themselves in space. And it's less important what they're really made of, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, because if you're like me and you only, only have seen very, very basic chemistry, then most properties are determined by whatever kind of element you're looking at. But the element is also a very, very tiny compound, of course. And as soon as you have bigger compounds, uh, the parts of life, Shaka is really huge, for example, uh, DNA, proteins, whatever. It really matters how they lie in space. It's not so important. It also is important, but not so important what kind of the various building blocks are. They are the same, always the same anyway. Things so like a carbonite and uh, hydrogen. That's essentially it. And they arrange themselves nicely in space. And it turns out that arranging in space is exactly what knot theory studies. And it turns out that um, a lot of parts of life, um, kind of molecular biology, are studying knot theory in a certain sense. So they also have those knotted proteins here and in the experiments, they usually get some shadows of them. And then they would like to know what kind of protein it is, or what kind of properties you can read up from the shadow, and so on. So there's a nice back and forth between the two pictures. And it's kind of part of the story today. Um, yeah, so there's kind of this back and forth between the two pictures. In particular, well, not a protein, but DNA, so this is a real picture of DNA. So kind of the story is roughly as follows. Uh, so DNA sits in the nucleus of the cell and it's kind of this helix type structure and life does the following. So when I have some type of cable, which is which I think is very important, but I only use it every 10 days or so, what will I do instead of um, storing it very carefully, I usually just crump it together and put it somewhere. And then I uh, just need it again in 10 days. I uh, pick it up and it's knotted. What a surprise, right? Think of uh, whatever some sort of cable you need for your computer. You don't need it all the time. So you put it away, or at least if I put it away, I'm so lazy. I just crump it somewhere, I just put it somewhere. I don't care. And as soon as you pick it up, what a surprise, it's, it's knotted. And some of the same thing happens with DNA. So most of the time, DNA just somehow sits in the nucleus. I'm oversimplifying here, obviously, but it somehow also just sit, sits in the nucleus of the cell, which is kind of the box where I would put my little cable into. And life does exactly the same. It just 
squeezes it into the nucleus. And as soon as you need it, let's say for reproduction, you need to pull it out and oh, what a surprise, it's dotted. So <laughs> if you pull out the DNA from the nucleus, the life does exactly the same thing as I do. It's too lazy to do it, although we all know it will end up dotted. Anyway, so life has come up with some strategies. Instead of fixing that problem, just putting it nicely away, no, life decided to do exactly what I do. Well, I will then sit down and try to untangle my little cable, and life does exactly the same. Uh, so there are some enzymes, and they do some operations like this. And that's a scale relation, all right. So here's an overcrossing, um, and here's an undercrossing. And over and under here, refer to, uh, I refer to the left-hand strand, whether it goes over or under. And those enzymes change um, the two crossings. So kind of, it's kind of fun. So Mars should be able to explore this because life actually is exploring it for 100 billion years or something. I have no idea. Um, but it's kind of fun. It's really, it's really silly. And I, like you put it in a box. Um, you know that it will be knotted. You pull it out. Oh, it's knotted. And you need to unknot it. And you come up with some strategies of doing this. Um, that we call this a crossing swap here. OK. So this is a little bit backward. Actually, it turned out that the Kane relation was first discovered in mathematics. And then it turned out that people figured out in biology, oh, that's exactly what life is doing. Um, so <laughs> life and mass go hand in hand, which is which is really cool. But what I like here again is, well, I am certainly too lazy. I'm certainly a failure of nature. So it's totally clear that my cable gets knotted because I just squeeze it into a box or whatever. But life is doing exactly the same thing. And then obviously it needs to come up with some strategy to untangle it because it needs to be untangled for something like reproduction. Anyway, anyway, so this is a skein relation. So it, it relates. Um, the two forms of a crossing in a shadow, like an overcrossing and an undercrossing. And it turns out that this is enough to untangle all knots. Right? That's what life wants to do. There's some tangling going on here, whatever, and we need to untangle it. And may maybe this operation is actually not enough, but it is actually enough to untangle all knots. And to see that, so this simple operation, just swapping crossings, is enough to un unknot DNA or to unknot all knots. And the way to see this is pretty beautiful, actually. So um, here's an algorithm that does that. You start somewhere on your knot, doesn't matter where, you just start somewhere, and you say you like one form of a crossing. So in this case, I like the going over, but I don't like the going under. So I don't like going under, I like going over. So um, since I like going over, all I do is I apply this crossing swap to all going unders. So I start here, I go under, going under is bad. So I turn it around and I go over. I continue walking, I go over. Aha, uh -huh, go over is okay, I leave it what it is. I continue walking, I go under and I swap it again. And then I'm done in this case because only have, I only have three crossings. And the knot you see, so this is a non-trivial knot. Uh, this is a trefoil and this is a trivial knot. And you might already be able to see it. You could just take this strand and pull it, pull it away here. But the better way to see this is that my little algorithm actually does the following to the three-dimensional knot, because I kind of prefer over uh, versus under, and I swap everything to over. Essentially, what I do is I create a helix in a helix again in three space, and that's certainly uh, not knotted. So this will then connect down to here again, right? Because I'm always walking over the knot in three space. Actually, just arranges itself in a helix that goes upwards. And life knows that for, for ages, and that's it's essentially how uh, you can unknot every knot using this operation, and you can unknot any knotted DNA using this operation. So now I just need to be able to use this operation um, for my cable. Turns out that I can't. I need to do, I need to do something more fancy. Uh, but anyway, so here in mathematics, we can actually do that. And what we can do is we just produce a helix and we can undo all knot. All knots. So if you can swap crossings, you can actually undo all knots. And as I said, life is doing that for uh, whatever millions of years. So it's kind of natural for mass to discover it as well. And that's what people did. So people then um, had this relation that overcrossing equals undercrossing. And since we're doing mathematics, we just were in some scalars A and B. Yeah, so there are just some some funny scalars here, A and B, because we're doing mathematics and why not? So if we get scalars, you can scale things, why not? Um, turns out that there you can also have 
an error term like the undoing. That's not what life does. So for life, C is actually zero. Um, but in, in this general scan relation, this is a relation. It's a linear combination between three pictures, essentially the linear combination between the three ways to connect uh, the four points that you see on the outside. And um, if you apply this correctly, you get a linear combination of unlinks. And that's kind of the point, because you kind of have this, uh, I can unlink everything. And of course, this error term here is completely harmless. It gets even easier. So you don't need to worry too much about the error term. Uh, here down here is an example for this linear combination, a very famous one, which is Alexander's linear combination, and which was the first one to discover it in mathematics. So A equals one, B equals one, and C some extra parameter that we call Q. So in this business, parameters are very often called Q. If you want to call it X, call it X. It's just a parameter. But anyway, so you can do it then to every knot. For example, you just swap the crossing up here, as you can see, and you get this error term where the crossing is resolved. And this knot is easier than the knot we started with. This knot is easier than the knot we started with. So some induction or recursion process um, will uh, make this terminate. And you get a linear combination of unlinks in the end. And that's what uh, life does all the time, just for A and B equals 1 and C equals 0. And the first one discovered in mathematics was the one by Alexander. Um, and it is the A, it's not quite the same as life. Still A, B equals one, but C equals some variable, right? So it's kind of the natural choice that you would do. There are two, uh, well, A equals one, B equals one, that makes sense. And then C equals zero or not, right? So this is essentially the difference. C is zero uh, or C is not zero. That's essentially the difference. Uh, this is life and this is Alexander. And they were discovered, well, <laughs> Life discovered that a long, long time ago at Alexander um, about 100 years ago, say. It's kind of fun. So this is the one you maybe would naturally write down eventually. So just up to scale as just A and B as just one. And then you can decide whether you want to have an error term uh, or not. And yeah, so the general solution is A, B, C. Life is the one with 1, 1, 0. Alexander is the one with one, one Q. And then there's a slightly funny thing here that, that I certainly wouldn't come up with in any way. And that's a famous Jones polynomial, which was discovered way, way later than the Alexander one. So the Alexander's invariant here is was 28. And this one is the famous one that was discovered 85. So that's quite, quite a bit later. And as you can see, the, the, this was discovered millions of years ago. This is like... Uh, so as mo more fancy the scalars get, the more complicated it is. And what do I mean by discovered? You can just say I have ABC and you can just put in everything I want for ABC. Well, you need to be careful. Not all combinations of ABC actually will give you a link invariant. Most of them actually won't. So only some of them work. And by experience, kind of most like 99.9% .9 of all choices for ABC just simply won't work. Right? So the ABC is just kind of the general approach, but you need to be careful. And most of them, no, nope, no way. Okay, so it's really hard to discover anything because 99.9% .9 just don't work. And they had then the two natural choices you would try, um, Alexander and life, and 99% of all choices that work will give you either of those. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of fun. So it's essentially impossible to discover the Jones polynomial if you want. And that's why this was such a breakthrough. So all other choices are, are really just a miracle that they work. I mean, who would put this funny scalar in front? So the scalars are very subtle. And um, only, uh, as I said, only 0.01% only even work. And only 0.01% of those who work give something that is equivalent in some way to either life's choice or Alexander's choice. Okay, so the skein relation is really just relating an over and an under crossing. And life does this for millions of years already. The kind of life is kind of a fun part of the story here. At the easiest possible choice, where the error term is zero and all the other scalars are one. And the most next complicated one was discovered about 100 years ago. Uh, that's Alexander's choice. And then there are others, and they are so rare, it's essentially impossible to find them by hand, which makes the invariance you get from them. So really, really, really amazing. 
So I should have said that more clearly. So all legit choices give you an invariant. That's why you are up for up for this. So we have life invariant, which is a bit boring, Alexander's invariant, and uh, Jones's invariant, and they're all really good. And they get kind of get better as you get get along to more complicated choices of scales. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.